my ill. They are causing me to stop the race and the author is saying, no, it's the reverse. Hardships are meant to cause you to spur yourself on in the race. They're not meant to stop you or to kill you. They're not obstacles in your past that you cannot overcome. They're placed there to motivate you, to motivate us in this race that Christ has placed us into. And so the author is going to correct their understanding. They've forgotten a basic point about discipline. Maybe you would want to read Psalm 119 later this afternoon or tomorrow on your day off if you have a day off. And think about what the author says there about his longing for the Word of God. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation day and night. There are so many statements over and over and over again about how he just is consumed with studying the Word of God. And that is to be our attitude, isn't it? We read Scripture. We ask God, help me to understand what I read. Help me to apply it to my life. And I think any pastor can thank members in his congregation, members that study scripture and they think about what they're reading. They meditate upon it, sometimes deeply wondering how will I apply this to my life. For those of you that are living like that, praise the Lord. You're a great encouragement probably to the leaders and you are the ones that are being examples in your congregation. Now this passage, if you're one of those mature types, your application is going to come again at the end. You have a responsibility in this church. And yet the truth here is that not all Christians in the church are growing in their knowledge of learning how to apply the Word of God to their life. Many Christians still make foolish decisions, don't they? They still make poor decisions and they don't think about the consequences. Many Christians they don't know their Bibles very well. And again, the reason why I say there's no excuse is because if you have access to the Internet, you have access to thousands of free books, excellent books that we could probably never read in a lifetime. We are overwhelmed with information to help us grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ. So there isn't any excuse for not growing. Hardship is not an excuse for not growing. Busyness is not an excuse for not growing in our faith in deepening our walk with the Lord. We can ask God in prayer to help us study your scriptures on a regular basis. I personally have been blessed with this ESV study Bible. You can buy it probably from, directly from the, uh, the, uh, the Philippine Bible Society for about 1,280 pesos. It is probably one of the best study Bibles you can buy today. It is filled with notes that are thoughtful and that will really help you understand your Christian faith better. So this common problem can be overcome. The United Nations, they try to fight various forms of poverty, don't they? They try to overcome illiteracy in different parts of the world, so we in the church should try to overcome biblical illiteracy that sometimes prevails in us today. And that sets the scene for the quotation in the second part of Verse 5. What does it say there? It's quoting from Proverbs chapter 3. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by Him. Again, the, the word son there in, the, in Proverbs 3, the, the word son appears over and over in the context of a home. A father teaches a son, mother teaches a daughter, the parents teach the children. And in that context, the parents are telling the ch child, don't forget what I'm teaching you. Listen to the, your, the instruction of your parents so that you can apply it to your life when you live, when you leave the home. And the author takes that wisdom setting and now he applies it to all Christians. Christians, listen and learn what God has taught us. Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. And here there are two sinful extremes to avoid that most of us, depending upon your personality, you fall into one of the extremes. If you know the extreme, it helps us to keep the balance. What is the first common mistake? And these are basically opposites of one another. The first one is when God disciplines us, we disdain it. We disdain it. We show no concern. It's kind of an arrogant carelessness. We don't connect in our mind, in our life, the hardship with the fact that God might be teaching something. We blow it off. And there are some Christians that 
they may go through a difficulty and a trial and they seem to not learn the lesson that God wanted them to learn. Maybe all of us have experienced that at some point. Despising God's discipline. It's like you take the Lord's Supper and yet you're living in sin. You're, you're not understanding why you're suffering hardship. That is a way of disdaining God in the church. So we can disdain discipline. The second one is to be dismayed. That's the opposite. Overwhelmed with God's discipline so much that it paralyzes us. And what normally happens in that situation? Christians who struggle with this response often look very humble, don't they? Oh, woe is me, it's been a rough week. And they can get you to think pity upon them. They are suffering so bad that they just cannot bear up with it. And they are struggling so bad that they're ready to lose heart and they're ready to quit the race. They cannot take another step in the race. It just hurts too bad. That is another common extreme. Self-pity is not humility, is it? Self-pity is just a form of pride. It's a different kind of pride. When people, this is the ultimate kawawanaman. When you see that, don't show pity to a person like that. You're helping them remain in their dismay. Suicide is the ultimate form of that in, in, in the life of a person. They, they just have no hope anymore. And so they take their life. And so whether you disdain God's discipline or are dismayed at it, the author is saying here in this verse, don't react either way. Proverbs teaches us this. And besides, 1 Corinthians 10.13 gives us a promise. God doesn't load a burden on you so heavy that you cannot continue serving Him. He always provides a way for you and I to get out of the trial, whether it's temptation or whether it's a difficult burden in our life. He sustains us by His grace. And so we don't want to respond with arrogance and carelessness. Care thus about that, Lord. I see no connection to that in my life. Or we do not want to despond by being so overwhelmed that we don't have any hope. We want to respond in a way that he presents us that is biblical. Now remember, not all discipline is punishment. Some of these people, these Christians, experiencing their hardship, a common problem when Christians experience hardship is what? Withdraw from the worshiping assembly. They no longer came to church because they were discouraged and they slowly begin to commit the first steps of the dangers of apostasy. And so the author says earlier, don't withdraw from the assembly. Don't neglect to meet together in your worship. Having said that, I want to go through just three kinds of divine discipline. I picked this up from other authors that are very helpful. But this is basically what it, many people agree upon. First of all, God can send corrective discipline into your life and my life. If you're going to live in sin and if you're not going to repent, God can discipline you anytime He wants. You can't hide from Him. King David is the classic example. Saul Bathsheba slept with her. The consequences, even though he repented and was forgiven, the consequences upon himself, his family, and the kingdom lasted for decades. And we want to stress that he was forgiven. But again, the challenge is anyone that is living in a secret sin and you think you can hide it from Maybe your family member, your church mates, you might be able to for a long time. But God has a thousand ways to expose it, even though you may try to cover it up. I would encourage you, if you're in that situation, repent now and humble yourself before the Lord. Because God can send severe corrective discipline in our lives if we do not repent. That is a difficult. The longer you wait, sometimes the more painful it might be. Secondly, there's another kind of discipline that is preventative discipline. God puts things in our life to prevent us from sinning. This is a form of protection. And we think that that might be what Paul experienced in this thorn in the flesh. I'm not sure exactly what that is. There's a lot of different explanations for that. But Paul was given amazing insights by God through Revelation, wasn't he? taken up into the third heaven. He experienced things as apostle and revelation bearer that practically no other Christian experienced. And I'm sure God knew that that could lead to pride in his life. 
very knowledgeable man. And yet God gave him this thorn in the flesh and Paul prayed, Lord, please remove that thorn. I don't like that thorn. Lord, please remove that thorn. I don't like this thorn. And God kept saying, no, it's for your good. It's there, Paul, to keep you humble so that you will not boast and become filled with pride and commit even greater sins. And God may do that in our lives as well. The challenging aspect to all of these forms of discipline is sometimes we may not fully understand which one it is. I don't know if God is sending something into my life to prevent me from sinning, but He could. He could send sickness into our lives to prevent us from some form of sinning. Third, sanctifying or maturing discipline. Job is the example here. We read in the first chapter of Job, he was a righteous man. Job was not living in sin, was he? He did not have secret sin in his life. He was a very faithful, godly man serving the Lord day after day after day, a great model for his family. And yet Job suffered hardships that even today the Bible does not fully tell us why he suffered those. Here's a mystery there, isn't it? All of his friends thought they knew and were trying to correct Job, but his old wise friends were demonstrating that they were fools, not understanding the great wisdom of God. And sometimes we have to simply say to one another, I don't know why you're suffering. I don't have an answer that I can go to in Scripture because God might be working in your life something that we don't understand and He may never tell us why. That is difficult to trust God when we don't know the answer why. But it's a form of discipline. It's a form of helping us to put our faith in the Lord more. And I'm not Catholic, I don't pray to Mary, I don't worship Mary, but Mary is perhaps one of the greatest examples in all of Scripture of a poor peasant teenage girl that believed God something that was entirely, from a human perspective, contradictory and impossible. When you study Luke with Pastor Gilbert, right? That's an amazing chapter in Scripture. Zacchaeus comes into the, te the temple and he is given a message by the angel a message that he could easily believe, humanly speaking, and he rejected it in unbelief, didn't he? That's why he couldn't speak. The angel comes to Mary after that and gave a, 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 a revelation that seems utterly impossible. You're going to have a child and there's no human father. That is an incredible example of faith in the New Testament. She did not understand. She was called all kinds of dirty names probably and accusations and yet she still trusted in God. And so I'm trying to help us to orient our minds that all of our hardships, no matter what they may be, we should understand them and be willing to consider God is sending some kind of discipline into my life so that I might trust in Him, not to help me stop the race, but help me to run with greater endurance. You've got to finish the race if you go to heaven. And having said that, we should clarify that not all of our hardships can be blamed upon God. All of us can make some very unwise decisions in our lives. And we can get ourselves into trouble, can't we? And when that happens, we need to be careful not to blame God that He is sending a hardship into my life. Maybe a practical illustration. When we think about this today, and I'll, I'll come back to later, is that when people try to rebuke Satan, when maybe they are bringing the trouble into their own lives, it's maybe their own fault. It's a very popular maybe misunderstanding today. Sometimes we get ourselves into trouble, and then we act like it's a discipline from the Lord and we ask our fellow believers to bail us out of the trouble. We need to be careful with that. Letter B. Divine discipline is necessary for our perseverance. In verses 6 through 8, discipline is proof that God loves you. It's evidence that God loves you. Think about it from that perspective. Verse 6, the Lord disciplines the one He loves and chastises every son, every daughter, every child whom He receives. That's an encouragement when you see it from this perspective. Again, this is the final quotation from Proverbs 3.12 that we're looking at here. And we need to stop and remind ourselves of that distinction we made in the beginning. God disciplines His children, but He does not send wrath upon us. God sends wrath.